capsulitis is one of the most common uh, shoulder ailment and it will be the most common diagnosis when a person starts to do a shoulder arthroscopic surgeries and it is most common in females about 40 to 60 years of age and uh, it can be a primary frozen shoulder or it can be a secondary frozen shoulder a primary frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis is usually idiopathic and a secondary uh, adhesive capsulitis can be either a post traumatic or can be a secondary to a surgery. Now the treatment of both of these is little different and I'll be coming on to that. So now if it is a primary or a idiopathic uh, kind of a adhesive capsulitis, you can straight away go and do an intra-articular arthrolysis. Whereas if it is a secondary kind of a um, adhesive capsulitis, which is probably secondary due to any trauma or any previous surgeries, you need to do both intra-articular as well as a subacromial work. And if there are some implants associated like any screws or plates inside, then probably you have to address those implants as well. Now, as I told you, secondary adhesive capsulitis will be a common uh, thing in your practice if you see, because most of the post-traumatic uh, uh, scenarios like plating or something like that, cannot get full motion sometimes and it can be without a, without a fracture fixation or a, or a fracture fixation and in these cases there will be intra-articular additions as well as a subacromial additions present. Now the natural history of adhesive capsulitis is in three stages. Stage 1 is freezing, stage 2 is frozen and stage 3 is thawing but uh, this is a more of a theoretical uh, staging pattern and not all of our clinical patients will follow these stages. But definitely, initially it will start with pain and then it will be stiffness and slowly they will resolve over time. There is a good association of a diabetic, uh, un uncontrolled diabetic and uncontrolled hypothyroidism with the incidence of adhesive capsulitis. And x-ray is always mandatory because many a times the patient has been diagnosed as a frozen shoulder and adhesive capsulitis and it's been continued treatment for that, but actually it is not a adhesive capsulitis, but actually a osteoarthritis or a locked posterior dislocation, which can be easily picked up in a X-ray. So always do an X-ray for a patient coming to you with a stiff shoulder adhesive capsulitis. And MRI is desirable, but it is not mandatory to treat. Uh, USG has not got uh, important role in this particular indication. Now, as far as the MRI is concerned, there is a very good uh, uh, indications. The MRI features are edema in the IGHL, uh, anterior and posterior pericapsular edema, fluid around the biceps tendon, uh, obliteration of the fat in the subcoracoid triangle, uh, thickness of the humeral and the glenoid portion of the anterior band of the IGHL, thickness in the axillary uh, uh, capsule in the axillary pouch, uh, thickness in the coracohumeral ligament and uh, decreased height and width of the axillary pouch. So this is a this is a feature. Uh, this is a uh, MRI which which shows increase in the rotator interval. You can see hyper intense tissue in the rotator interval tissue, which is suggestive of a tight uh, rotator interval and uh, finding suggestive of adhesive capsulitis. And if you so see downwards, you will see that the inferior axillary pouch is obliterated and it is tight. And if you see here in the second image, you will see a slit light axillary pouch, which is very characteristic of a stiff or shoulder or adhesive capsulitis. And if you see up, as, as we were discussing earlier, you may see impingement phenomenon in many cases. So impingement can be a uh, associate factor for a secondary kind of a adhesive capsulitis. Now the, there is a staging system based on the MRI. The stage one is basically the IGHL thickness, uh, only thickness with edema. The stage 2, the thickness of the IGHL band will increase. The stage 3, the IGHL thickness will be there, but it will be decreased with the decreasing edema. And in the stage 4, the thickness will decrease still further and there will be no edema. So it will be a sort of a resolving kind of a stage. Now, intra-articular steroids has been uh, advocated since long for, the, uh, for use in adhesive capsulitis. They works on the principle of the chemical ablation of synovitis, but uh, nowadays it is it has to be used with a little caution. Uh, uh, similar with the manipulation of the uh, manipulation under anesthesia, using a short liver arm technique. This was a popular technique few few years back, 
and you do it in the order of a sphere that is flexion extension abduction and external rotation uh, it is not in my personal preference because it can cause some kind of complications like dislocations fractures uh, cuff injuries and uh, typically the labral kind of injury with the anterior uh, sort of a chip fractures of the glenoid now this is one of the uh, procedure or one of the surgery in which i uh, seriously admitted that admit that i have done a lot of uh, complications myself uh, in my starting days so initially if you choose a case of a stiff shoulder or adhesive capsulitis it will be a diff difficult case because entry into the shoulder will be little, little difficult and occasionally if you force your uh, scope or the force your trocar you might go into the humeral head itself or you can do stuffing of the articular cartilage so it has to be done with a ex uh, extreme caution because here the chances of it atrogenic injury are high so my personal algorithm is if an atraumatic portal if you can make easily then you can go ahead and do a intra articular work intra articular adhesive lysis if you cannot make a atraumatic portal easily and you feel there is a very tight kind of a capsule you do a gentle kind of a manipulation this manipulation should not be forceful as as i told you earlier so we don't recommend manipulation as a therapy for a stiff shoulder but if it is uh, you can just do a very little gentle manipulation so that you just make the space so that your scope can enter and then you can do a retry if you can go into the uh, shoulder it is fine well and good and you can go ahead with your intra articular arthroscopic arthrolysis and stiff uh, if still you are not able to enter into the joint then it is better not to use that approach uh, just uh, abandon the use of this particular technique and shift to a procedure which is called as an extra articular arthrolysis so i'll just be coming to what is the extra articular arthrolysis now as i told you there are two arthroscopic approaches one is a conventional arthroscopic arthrolysis which i told you that occasionally it may be a difficult portal assess and chance of doing a articular cartilage damage and second is a extra articular arthroscopic arthrolysis it is a newer technique it needs little bit of more skill but it is safer and it is easier and uh, it gives you peace in the mind so it 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 prevents complications in your hand so this is a small video showing a intra articular arthrolysis it is pretty a straight forward thing and you should do it in a 360 degree uh, angle starting from the top to the bottom and then you can go uh, around 360 degrees using all the portals that chirag has wonderfully described in his talk on bankart repair uh, you usually go from the igh um, mghl then ighl anterior band posterior band and you may release the additions anterior and posterior to the subscapulars as well so this is if you can enter the joint easily without a problem now the tips and tricks of doing a intra articular arthrolysis uh, very important avoid any forceful manipulation we don't we don't recommend and don't encourage any forceful manipulation because that can cause uh, complications uh, avoid atrogenic injury avoid forcing your trocar and uh, uh, trocar and cannula forcefully into the joint uh, if you are doing a release go from superior to inferior in your release uh, if you are doing whenever you are doing an inferior release be very careful of the axillary nerve uh, and the trick to prevent injury to the axillary nerve is you keep your wand closer to the glenoid and keep your wand at a low temperature now this is a small video this is a basically an extra articular arthrolysis so as i told you i use this technique specifically if i am not able to make a safe and secure portal with a posterior uh, portal uh, and if i am struggling to make my posterior portal because of a tight capsule and in th that case i'll go on the subacromial space just like you do any other rotator cuff surgery and you do a subacromial debridement it will not be a difficult thing because most of these patients will not have a, a significant subacromial bursitis or adhesions uh, if it is a primary uh, kind of a adhesive capsulitis and then we will go into the rotator interval tissue and we will identify the biceps tendon and this is the biceps tendon which we have identified in the rotator interval tissue and after that what we can do is we can just release the biceps tendon on and uh, in most of these patients whom i am operating for a stiff shoulder adhesive capsulitis for a frozen shoulder 
i will be tending to do more of a biceps stenotomy in these cases because biceps in these patients many of these patients will be pathologic and will be all, uh, also a cause of pain so most of these cases i would like to do a, a release of the biceps and uh, usually i do it from the attachment so from the superior uh, labrum kind of a thing you will just do a biceps stenotomy so once you do a biceps stenotomy then you need to release a little bit more of the tissue from the rotator interval thing this will be a tedious procedure because some of the times you will see a lot of bleeding here and it, it will be difficult to triangulate but uh, as i told you it will take more time but it will be a more safer approach than causing a hydrogenic harm to the uh, cartilage and to the bone as such and here we are doing a tenotomy of the biceps and once we are doing once we do a tenotomy nicely uh, and with you release some tissue in the rotator interval area then you will be able to enter into the joint nicely through this window which is called as a rotator interval window and this is now the humeral head you can see and then you can go in nicely with the superior lateral portal and from here you can just do your releases from the top and these are little bit of releases that we want to do and be very careful we don't want to injure a rotator cuff the supraspinatus will be back uh, there so we don't want to in, uh, injure the supraspinatus tendon there now we will like to identify the subscapulis tendon the structure you see on the back is the subscapulis tendon and we want to release the adhesions anterior and posterior to the subscapulis tendon so we release the tendons uh, the adhesions anterior and posterior to the subscapulis tissue again we will be using a lot of shaver and rf in that particular area because it will be a tight kind of a space and mobility will be difficult and once you do that uh, then your mobility will be increased and at this point you can even make your posterior portal and this is this is the anterior portal this is a standard portal that we make the structure that you see here is the subscapulis tendon and now we can do a release of the subscapulis tendon anterior and posterior and uh, as siddharth was mentioning the structure which is anterior to the subscapulis tendon here in this area is the mghl and here we would like to release the mghl so with with our arthroscopic scissor punch we release the mghl here uh, very nicely and then you can use your rf to release more of the capsule and once your mghl is released and you have released the rotator interval then you will be able to make all your portals including the posterior portal and the anterior superior portal everything and then you can do the your standard if you are able to make your posterior portal with a wisinger rod then you can do your standard uh, releases like the any other procedure and the structure that you see here down is the anterior band of the igchl now because we have released the uh, release the mghl the, uh, the subscap is seen right here and this band is the anterior band of the igchl uh, and then you can use either your rf and your cautery to release this anterior band of the igchl and once you release this your shoulder will be supple enough to be uh, to get an, any of the uh, portals you want to use for doing your so this is again this is the final step we are releasing the anterior band of the igchl so once we do this the shoulder will become very supple and then you can use any of your portals to uh, make your uh, uh, releases so you can then you can increase insert your wisinger portal from the posterior portal and you uh, continue your standard uh, intra articular arthrolysis kind of a picture now this was actually a approach which was described by laurent lafos in arthroscopy journal in 2012 when these are the beautiful pictures he has uh, published in that article and uh, these are the videos and this is you can see that there is a 360 degree release nicely done with a glenoid uh, very nicely exposed now the sequence in this particular technique is subacromial bursectomy release of the rotator interval tissue addressing of the biceps tissue i usually recommend a tenotomy in all, almost all of my patients and then you do a anterior and posterior release and in the end you do a inferior release taking care of the axillary nerve don't be very aggressive in the inferior portion so the tips and pearls of this particular approach is that is you need to do it in lateral position uh, you do it in a abduction neutral position start with the subacromial decompression you enter into the joint through the rotator interval tissue do a extensive sub subscapulis release both anterior and posterior and you view the joint superiorly through the rotator interval tissue and then you release the anterior capsule through the anterior portals and the posterior capsule by the posterior or the anterior portals 
and you must remember the axillary nerve anatomy the axillary nerve starts from the anterior and it goes to the posterior part of the shoulder just inferior to the shoulder and through the quadrilateral space so you should be always be careful about axillary nerve when you are doing this particular surgery we always close to your glenoid so uh, for for this the tricks to prevent injury to the axillary nerve you remain closer to the glenoid than than to humerus it is closest at 530 uh, 530 to 6 o'clock position so uh, you be, be very careful at that particular position the safest position is abduction neutral don't do it in a lot of uh, abduction and release the it closer to the glenoid and keep your vent temperature low uh post operative you can start immediately uh, mobilize the patient while it is in the block give a good pain management and start early active physiotherapy so these are the basic things that you want to uh do while doing a arthroscopic release of a stiff shoulder thank you prathamesh there are few questions from the audience uh the first question i don't know the name but the redmi But do you do bicep stenosis also? No. Uh, in in case of stiff shoulder, uh, I don't do bicep stenosis because uh, I don't want to do any surgery which can which can cause more stiffness, and I don't want to immobilize this patient. Also, we want to immobilize them fast. So I never do a stenosis in a stiff shoulder. Correct. So I think the biceps in the stiff shoulder there is a capsulitis is already there in the groove of the bicep. So biceps. i don't think there will be popeye deformity usually ha huh, usually the popeye de deformity yeah. will not be there yeah the other questions from the suryakan purohit so what is the right term for stiff shoulder is it frozen shoulder adhesive capsulitis or periarthritis so so all are right but uh, personally we, uh, we should use adhesive capsulitis in our medical records dr pratnesh i have not referred in this recently there was a meeting organized by sesi and they were they had a long discussion on the uh, nomenclature so what the isecos committee suggests is the frozen shoulder being the right term okay and the capsulitis is a misnomer and the actually the consensus and worldwide thing that is coming up is frozen shoulder is the right term it looks like more like a layman term but it is the right term to be used and i think that is the context of this question basically what you want uh, siddharth actually all these things are so dynamic that the same uh, same meeting which was organized maybe 5 or 6 years back with the same persons oh, of just, uh, yeah, yeah. the last month it was organized on that uh, sesi organized this series of webinars yeah i know and uh, there was one uh, 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 earlier there was a group of our shoulder arthroscopic surgeons uh, and we used to have a meeting on every indian arthroscopic society meeting where only it was by invite where only shoulder surgeons used to meet and it was uh, i think 4 or 5 years back it was decided that we will call it a adhesive capsulitis okay. and what you were saying that frozen shoulder is i think 3 years back we have decided to call it a frozen shoulder so yeah. it's a dynamic thing and it's um, i don't think it um, uh, matters actually matters yeah. actually over difference actually it's one it's one more important thing what prathmesh what i want to mention is that we all know that because of adhesive capsulitis or may frozen shoulder the capsule inferior capsule is so tight that it usually pulls axillary nerve up so it makes it more dangerous to oh, operate in that area because um, uh, my teachers used to tell me that you release uh, not 360 you release it 350 only <laughs> and 10 10% you leave, uh, leave uh, inferior one and yes. do it by manipulation it won't yes. do a dislocation kind of thing yes. because the rest you have done it cleanly because uh, uh, axillary nerve usually it is pulled up with the capsule and it is in the adhesions so uh, there are very high chances that by releasing it with the rf we can damage it there are many people who are doing it with the um, uh, scissor punches and all second thing pratmesh i want to ask when when you are doing this uh, bicep stenotomy extra articularly your scope is in the posterior portal only or you are uh, taking it to the anterior this is, this is actually a lateral or a posterior lateral portal sir posterior lateral portal lateral to okay. the posterior lateral this, yeah, just because the same portal that you are using for the bird's eye view okay right right because because it is very difficult uh, from the posterior portal to visualize the subscap uh, yes this is this is more of a lateral portal sir more of a lateral portal. more of a lateral portal and any any other specific technique uh, how to find out uh, uh, biceps extra articularly so what you can do is you can follow the uh, coracoacromial ligament yeah. and then you can reach up to to coracoid anteriorly 
right and through the uh, uh, coracoid uh, the, there will be some you can uh, sometimes you can identify the coracohumeral ligaments so you can mm-hmm. identify and release that area so there will be okay. a little bleeding but mm-hmm. you can do a gentle debridement in that area and uh, with some little bit of uh, effort you can usually be able to find the biceps in that particular yes. area and and um, how frequently while doing a intra articular capsular release you are releasing the ca ligament from the coracoid uh the coracohumeral ligament sir coracoacromial ligament no i don't do a coracoacromial ligament you you don't do it because because there are few uh, books that mention that you have to release the part because it is also uh, when you release a rotator interval just anterior to that on, on the coracoid you find that thing okay. i don't release a coracoacromial uh, ligament i release uh, the chl if they, if it is there coracohumeral ligament if coracohumeral it is there, yeah. a part of it can be released yeah because uh, few there are few people who release uh, coracoid completely so they say that it causes uh, it is also a cause of a adhesive capsulitis mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 